welcome again, folks, to Valley View Baptist Church in North Ogden, Utah. We're delighted to be with you as we have another message and a little time of worship, one with another. So several weeks ago, I spoke on our exceeding abundantly able God. Today, I want to share part two of, of this theme. And in our first message, we discussed how God opened the Red Sea for the children of Israel. Today, I want to share more examples of our exceeding abundantly able God. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, we beseech you, we honor you, we worship you. You certainly are our exceedingly abundantly able God. And so, Heavenly Father, as we share from your word, pray that you'd open the minds and hearts of people, that we would learn from this, that we would be challenged by this. Lord, and once again, I pray for those first responders, those folks that are really in the trenches uh, doing uh, honorable work to save lives. And I do pray, Father, that you'd kill the virus that's killing so many people. So we ask your blessing on this message and our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, once again, I'll start my message as I have the last few, last few weeks. Faith defeats fear. Faith defeats stress. Faith defeats worry. Faith defeats anxiety. And so, once again, let's look over to Ephesians 3, just two verses there, verses 20 and 21 on Ephesians 3. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly of all, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen. And so I would just say, God still in the miracle working business. He's still on the throne. He's still all knowing everywhere present at the same time and, and everywhere. And so as we continue to deal with this killer virus, folks, Let's talk about and remember our God. He is our exceeding, abundantly able God. So just to show uh, how awesome he really is, I have a list here. I have a topical Bible in my study, and I, I looked up uh, miracles, and it lists all the miracles. In, in the Bible. I'm just going to read a few of them uh, so that we can kind of get a, an idea of just how awesome our God is. Go all the way back. Creation in Genesis 1. Flood in Genesis 7 and 8. Confusion of tongues in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. The fire on Abraham's sacrifice, Genesis 15. Conception of Isaac, Genesis 17. Destruction of Sodom in Genesis 19. Lot's wife turned to salt. Closing of the womb of Abimelech's household. Opening of Hagar's eyes. The conception of Jacob and Esau. Opening of Rachel's womb. Flaming a bush in Exodus. Transformation of Moses' rod into a serpent. Moses' leprosy. Plagues in Egypt. Pillar of the pillar of cloud and fire in Exodus, passage of the Red Sea, destruction of Pharaoh and his army, sweeting the waters of Mara, manna, quails, defeat of Amalek, transfiguration of the face of Moses, water from the rock, thundering and lightning on Sinai, Miriam's leprosy, judgment of fire, destruction of Korah, the plagues, Aaron's rod, buds, waters from the rock in Kadesh, 
scourge of serpents, destruction of Nabad and Abihu, Balaam's ass speaks, preservation of Moses and the Jordan divide. That's where we're going to talk uh, today, folks, about this. Just I just wanted to share that because, you know, we sometimes we don't really realize how awesome God really is. And so this one miracle after another, and, and I read maybe a third of them that's in the, in the scriptures. And it's just, I just want us to think about a God who is exceedingly abundantly able. Isn't that uh, awesome? So I would just say to all these, we do have, and the God that did all these miracles in the scriptures is the same God that can do miracles today. He hasn't lost anything. He is perfect. He does, you cannot change him. He is a changeless God. He is an all-knowing God. And he's an all-loving God. So as we study this uh, about him opening the Jordan River uh, and the message that we have there. So I would share that as kind of an opening uh, statement uh, with you folks. So we want to go over to the book of Joshua. And we're going to talk about the chapter 3 in uh, the passage of uh, of Jordan. Now let me read the first five verses and we'll talk about that and go on with the rest of the book. And Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which we must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So Joshua rose early in the morning to meditate on the word, to prepare himself for the day's duties. It was not left for Joshua to invent a method of crossing the flood of Jordan and God had given him all the instructions necessary. The key word in this, these verses is ark. It's used 10 times. Of course, the ark symbolized the presence of God. The ark went before the people to learn to lead them. And it was kept in the midst of the river till all the nation had passed over, you know, Christ always goes before us. Isn't that amazing? Uh, he always goes before his people and opens the way. But the people must sanctify themselves. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we should not fear God's leading. We should not fear God's uh, direction. God was going to lead the Jews in a new way and they had to be ready because it says there in verse four, for ye have not passed this way here too before. So God was given. And you know, when you accept Christ, you've never been that way before. It's something new. And God, God just honors, honors that uh, so much. So if we go down a couple more verses 
And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be uh, with, with thee. In verse 8, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. Well, to God be the glory, uh, his due. But God sees fit to magnify his servants that their people might honor them. I read in scriptures about God magnified Solomon. God magnified Moses. God magnified uh, David. And so God just wants us to magnify God so he can magnify us. It's a beautiful relationship, a very personal uh, relationship. And so I would share with you that uh, uh, we have to obey him. And let me read to you Philippians 1, 20 and 21. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also uh, shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a personal relationship with, with God. Well, let's talk about the miracle then. The Lord said to Moses, this day will I begin to magnify, or to Joshua, excuse me, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. Well, before his death, it had been revealed to Moses by the Lord that Joshua should be his successor as the leader of his people. And unto that office he had been solemnly set apart. Moses had also announced unto Israel that Joshua should cause them to inherit the land. We read that in Deuteronomy. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses also in Deuteronomy. After the death of Moses, the people had avowed their willingness to do whatever Joshua commanded them to do and go whither he should send them and express the desire that divine assistance would be granted him. The Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. We read further in that chapter, verses 16 and 17. In the interval, the two spies surveyed Jericho at his orders. The people had followed him from Shittim to the Jordan and had remained there three days, which was the first part of that third chapter. And, had re and now the time had come for the Lord to more fully authenticate his servant. So Joshua had duly discharged his duty, and now he was to be rewarded. He had set before the people a noble example of acting faith on God's word, had confidently expressed his assurance that God would make good his promise. And we can read that in verse 11 and 13. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. And it shall come to pass, verse 13, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon the, the heap. That's just absolutely amazing how God has, has set this up uh, Joshua had been faithful in a few things, and he should be made ruler over many. Devotedness of, to God never goes unnoticed by, by God. 
uh, the Lord would now put signal honor upon Joshua in the sight of Israel as he had done uh, to Moses at the Red Sea. And remember in Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak unto thee and believe thee forever. Exodus 19.9. Thus did he honor and authenticate Moses. And here at the Jordan, he magnified Joshua by the authority which he conferred upon him and attested him uh, as his appointed leader of, of Israel. And so the Lord magnified Joseph, or Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they feared or revered or obeyed him as they feared Moses all the days of his, of his life. And so just to, to continue, we must be really careful here, folks, lest we overlook something far more glorious than what has just been shared with you. Surely those words, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, should be at once, we should turn our thoughts to the one infinitely superior to Joshua, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there was no substitute there. It was just that Joshua became virtually ordained by God and he accepted it humbly and fulfilled the desire of the Lord because he lived. He even says that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I don't want to emphasize Joshua too much. I just, I want to emphasize God uh, 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 a lot on, on this. And so, and this, this brings us, I want to share something that I didn't know before until I was preparing uh, this, this message. And so you remember when the Lord, bab or when the Lord was baptized in that, in that river, it says, Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We read that in Matthew chapter 3. Then was he made manifest to Israel, John 1, 31. Then was he authenticated for his great mission. Then did God begin to magnify him? Still more wonderful is the type which we observe at what part of the Jordan this occurred. Listen, this is exciting. Give me goosebumps when I studied it and, and read it, and it's, I've got goosebumps now as I share it, uh, share it uh, with you. These things were done at Beth Abara, John 1, 28, which signified the place of passage in John 1, 28, so that Christ was attested by the Father at the very same place where Israel passed through the river and where Joshua was magnified. Isn't that, what an awesome God we have, folks. In other words, he was, he was magnifying and showing his power to help the <clears throat> nation of Israel cross the Jordan River and hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, He's there when Jesus Christ, his son, was, was baptized. Very same spot on, on that. So it just, it just touched my heart as I, as I uh, read that. <clears throat> well, the 40 years wandering in the wilderness expired with the death of Moses. And all whose sins occasioned that punishment had also died. It was the new and younger generation over which Joshua was placed, and now a fresh chapter opened in the history of Israel. And you know, folks, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, a whole new chapter opens up 
in your life. It's, it's, I just want to continue to give you the invitation to know Jesus. As, and as we go through the trials of this, of this epidemic that, that we have worldwide, you know, God's still on his throne. God is, is still there. The Holy Spirit is, indwells the believer. The Holy Spirit is around us waiting and asking and seeking that you, that you ask Jesus to come into your heart. Oh, what a chapter in life it'll be. Oh, folks, be prepared and be ready. One day I'll talk to you about those two words. But it's just, just amazing how God laid out everything and then how Jesus came and laid out everything. And all of this was for the two sovereign things that God did. He established the nation of Israel and he established the church. And it's just amazing that those are the two sovereign acts, the most visible solemn acts that, that God uh, has, has done. So Israel's success, or rather the Lord showing himself uh, at Sinai and they're walking in implicit obedience unto God. Israel's crossing of the Jordan with their eyes fixed on the ark signified that they marched into Canaan led by the law. At that time, it was the law. Okay, when we come to the Lord, it's by, it's by grace. What has just been emphasized is of something more than mere his, historical importance. It is recorded for the instruction of God's people in all generations and needs to be turned by them into earnest prayer for divine enablement. It reveals to us the principal thing which the Holy One requires uh, from us if he is to undertake for us and make a way through whatever Jordan may confront us. You know, folks, we all have our Jordans. We all have those things that, hey, we got to get across this. We got to get to the other side. We have to get through this. And one of the most beautiful words in the English language is through. God saw the people through the Red Sea. He saw them through the Jordan. He saw them through the wilderness. He, he saw them over through Jordan again. And you know what? If we have our Jordans today, He's just waiting for us to seek him. Perhaps we can think of this virus as a Jordan that we have to pass. Trust God. Seek God. He is our all-sufficient God. And so I just wanted to uh, share, share that uh, with you. And so God cannot be the patron of sin. And therefore, he will not show himself strong in behalf of rebellious subjects. We must deny self and take up our cross in order to follow Christ. And what that signifies is made clear to us here in Israel's following the Ark of the Covenant. John, 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. And he walked in perfect subjection to the law of God. You see, folks, there has to be an action on our part. There has to be a commitment on our part. There has to be obedience on our part for us to really have the benefit and the joy of a closer walk with God. And so I encourage you, don't let your anxieties grow. Don't let your worries grow. Let your faith grow. And just lean on Jesus. He's, he's waiting uh, for there. And I'll read again uh, verse, uh, verse 8. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. What anointed eye can fail to see here again? A shadowing forth of a greater than Joshua as I mentioned a little earlier. Next, after the mention of God's beginning to magnify Joshua in the sight of the people, we find him exercising high authority 
and giving orders to the priest. And almost the first public act of Christ, after the Father had attested and honored him at the Jordan in the baptism, in that Sermon on the Mount, we beheld our Savior doing the very same thing, exercising high authority. That doesn't mean that we take power from. What we do is we use his power in our life and in our service and in our activities, in our relationships and in our attitudes. And so uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And so the priest, when bearing the Ark of the Covenant, were figures of the ministers of the gospel in their official character, but looked at as some privilege to draw near unto God. The priests were types of all the redeemed of Christ. And we can read that in 1 Peter. Schofield, Dr. Schofield had a note on them crossing the Jordan at the bottom of, of uh, his book, the Bible. It says, the passage of Jordan is a type of our death with Christ. And he mentions several passages of, of scripture there. Well, isn't that true? Types. We learn a lot about the different types in, in Scripture, but here we have the priest out in the water, and then they're standing in the water, and then the water moves, and he moves, and Joshua tells him to go out in the middle of the water, and then all of Israel passed over. And what did they see? They saw the Ark of the Covenant. You see, and when we pass over our Jordan, what do we see? We see Jesus Christ. We, we sense and feel and know the Holy Spirit. He'll see us through, folks. He'll see us through. He's got awesome plans. Yes, I, I do believe that the rapture of the church is soon, and that causes our hearts to be more diligent in reaching others so that they can spend eternity uh, with us. <clears throat> And so I guess I'm really emphasizing once again the all abundantly uh, able, sufficient uh, God that, that, that we, we have. Well, at the Exodus, God had proved himself Lord and the true God beside whom the gods of Egypt were but harmless idols. Now God would prove himself the Lord of all the earth. And we can read that in verses 11 and 13, which I shared with you uh, a few moments ago. But over in Psalm 97, 5, it says, the hills, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. All the gods of the heathen nations would fall before him. God would prove his power by holding back the waters of the flooded Jordan and permitting his people to cross over on dry land. Same way he did when they crossed the Red Sea, right? Cross on dry land. And so, well, in verses 14 through, through 17, Folks, we, we, we see that it all happened just the way God said it would. And the priests went before, bearing the ark, and when they dipped their feet into the water, God opened the river before them. Sometimes God's people have to get their feet wet by faith before God can go to work with them. You know, don't ever fear taking that first step to God, that first step to Jesus Christ, that first step to having Jesus Christ as your Savior, that first step on your journey then to eternity uh, with Him. Yeah, sometimes we have to get our feet wet and sometimes the water may be a little cold, but hey, it's worth the journey. Folks, it is, it's worth the, the journey well, the priests then walked to the midst of the river and stood there 
while all Israel passed over to the other side. Then they followed to the opposite side themselves. What a perfect picture of Christ. He goes before us to open the way. He stands with us until we cross over, and he follows behind us to protect us. God kept his word as his people trusted him and obeyed him and walked on dry ground over the, the Jordan. It's instructive to contrast the crossing of the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan. The first crossing illustrates separation from the past, the Egypt, the world. While the second crossing pictures entrance by faith into our spiritual inheritance in Christ. You see the difference? You see the difference? We're getting away from, uh, from the evil that they were under with Egypt. And now they are going into a, a place promised uh, by God to the nation of, of, of Israel. And so the enemy was defeated once and for all when the Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea. But the Jews had to win one victory after another when they crossed Jordan and entered Canaan. On the cross, Jesus Christ defeated our enemies. But we have to walk and war by faith if we are to have daily victory. We cross the Jordan when we enter by faith into the victory experience. And yes, we can have those experiences every day. We can get through the, the Jordan. Well, folks, I want to kind of move on here, but there were two piles of stones built. One by the 12 chosen men on the bank of the river. We read that in 312 and also go over in chapter four of Joshua and read those first eight verses. Uh, and the one by uh, Joshua in the midst of the river in uh, chapter four. They were to be memorials of the crossing and to us they convey wonderful spiritual truths. Listen, folks, let me just share this. Some of these things were just so exciting to me as I prepared, prepared the message. The 12 stones on the bank of the Jordan came out of the midst of the river, we see in verse 8, as evidence that God did part the waters and take his people safely across. The 12 stones hidden in the midst of the river could be seen only by God, but they too spoke of Israel's marvelous crossing. These two piles of stone picture Christ's death and burial, the hidden stones, the resurrection, the stones on the bank. At the same time, they illustrate the believer's spiritual union with Christ when he died. We died with him, we were buried with him, we arose with him in victory. And I want to share a couple of passages of scripture. I want to read to you Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Galatians 2, 20, Colossians 2, 13. And so, and then it'll bring us all right in to this. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That is the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. And one of the first verses that I memorized after I'd accepted Christ, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and died for me. He gave himself for me. And then over in Colossians uh, 2.13, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Wow. Those are some verses to really think about. The Jews could not get victory in Canaan and overcome the enemy without first going through Jordan. Nor can Christians today overcome their spiritual foes unless they die to self, reckon themselves crucified with Christ, and follow the Spirit to give them resurrection power. The Jews were no sooner safe on the other side than God commanded them to receive the mark of the covenant, which was circumcision. We read that in Genesis 17. Collectively, as a nation, they had gone through the experience of death in crossing the river. Now they were able to apply that, that death to self on an individual. We need to die to self. Well, folks, what a glorious God we serve. He is possessed of almighty power and infinite wisdom. All the powers and elements of nature are subject to him and make way for his presence. When he so pleases, he can alter all the properties of these elements and change the course of nature. Nothing is too hard for that one who has turned liquid floods into solid walls, who has called the sun to stand still, yea, even to go backwards. And 2 Kings 20, verse 11, who has made flint rocks to pour out fountains of water, ravens to feed Elijah, iron to swim, fire not to burn. He turned rivers into a wilderness and the water springs in day ground dry ground. He turned the wilderness into standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he is, make the, hun the hungry to dwell. And if such a God before us, who can be against us? Oh, I would want this message to touch your hearts and know and realize and reaffirm in your own mind and, and heart Hey, God's with us. God is able. He is forever the God. So the main lesson I would say is clear. There can be no conquest without death to self crossing the Jordan. And identification with Christ's resurrection, the two memorials of stone. Before the Jews could get victory over the enemy, they had to experience victory over sin and self. Well, how do you do that? It's faith. It's by faith. For by faith are you saved. And that's, I would encourage you uh, to do that. I want to close with a poem and then uh, a prayer and a benediction. So it says, a poem, my hand in God's. Each morning when I wake, I say, I place my hand in God's today with faith and trust that by my side he'll walk with me, my steps to guide. He leads me with the tenderest care when paths are dark and I despair. No need for me to understand if I but hold fast to his hand. My hand is his, no surer way to walk in safety through 
each day. By his great bounty I am fed, warmed by his love and comfort dead. When at day's end I seek my rest and realize how much I'm blessed, my thanks pour out to him and then I place my hand in God again. Oh, just grab hold of his hand. He's waiting. He's waiting there uh, for us. Well, I hope this has kind of encouraged us to realize what an awesome, uh, awesome God that we really, really have. And he's available uh, for us. Thanks for listening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the miracle that we shared together the crossing of of the Jordan River by the Jewish people. I can just see, see them marching by thousands, millions of them, seeing the, the Ark of the Covenant. And yes, it's symbolizing Christ. And each day we take, each, each Jordan we have to cross, let us look to Jesus. And I pray, Father, once again for those first responders those folks that are on the front lines. I pray for the families of, that have lost uh, loved ones in this virus. I just, I pray for our country. I pray for our president, Heavenly Father. But once I, I just want to share with the people listening, turn to Jesus. Recognize the power in our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And just reach out to him, for he's reaching out uh, to us. And remember, God loves you, and, and so do we. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, that kind of finishes up for, for this week. I tried really hard to get everything into to the message, and I would just ask that you, you might read in Ephesians a little bit. You might read in... Joshua, the first uh, uh, chapter three and uh, four of, of uh, Joshua. And so thanks for listening. And just remember, if you want to contact us, if you have a question or a comment, uh, and we'd certainly appreciate a donation to our ministry here if the Lord leads you. And so it's Valley View Baptist Church, Post Office Box 12653, Ogden, Utah. 84412. Thanks. God bless. Have a blessed day.